So they say that the best years for our brains are those between 20 and 25. Actually, we reach the creativity peak around 22. But at 27, our brain mass starts to decrease. And this is along its capabilities. Okay, now, if you are a researcher, that's me, if you are a researcher, when you're 22, you're most likely to be still working for some superior of yours, which means that at 22, you're probably not gonna be working on your own project. So, as you can see, there's a gap here. When you are at your creative best, you're not completely enabled to express your creativity. And a lot of potential might be going to waste because of this. But obviously, there must be a reason, right? And in fact, we gain knowledge, we gain confidence, and we gain experience with time. And these are all indeed needed qualities since biological research is complicated and difficult by definition. But let's try to imagine. What if we had a set of pre-made parts with known function that we could use in biology? What if these parts were standardized and super easy to use and documented on the web? What if they were composable, just like Lego bricks, allowing us to combine their function? And what if we could just go online and order them with a few clicks? Well, 10 years ago, this quest for making young students do actual biological creative research would probably have been marked as impossible. But right now, we think not so much. In fact, what if I told you that all this, all these what ifs, were already real? Well, meet synthetic biology. We all know that life is complicated. We've just said it, biology is complicated. And I mean, literally complicated. Look, this here is life. Synthetic biology is trying to simplify all this mess, filtering information so that we don't have to worry about it, and we can just focus on what we want to build. Now, everyone knows that DNA is the code of life. Genes code for the information relative to the different traits, and this is true for all organisms. And over the years, many of these gene sequences have been developed into those standardized DNA parts that are in a way very similar to those genetic Lego bricks from before. And what synthetic biology does is basically putting these bricks back together, creating living machines with new functions that were not found in nature before. This is a proper engineering approach, and this is highly simplifying the design process. And nowadays, we also have several key technologies that allow synthetic biology with this approach to grow and to advance as a field. We can now read DNA sequences, we can now make our own DNA molecules, we have those easy and standardized methods. We have more knowledge on gene function, gene behavior, and gene interaction. And also, we also have the internet. And I'm sure I don't need to explain to you about that. And together with the internet, open source is another key feature. Information from research teams all over the world is shared, and this is helping the synthetic biology community to grow really, really fast. And we're not just talking about information. Even the single DNA parts are shared and are available in a parts registry that's accessible, again, to all the labs in the world. And if this was not enough, the prominent cross-discipline features the focus on open source information and the power of the web have made synthetic biology a pillar of collective science. Okay, now, all these beautiful words, but now from theory to practice, we want to show you some examples of what people have done with synthetic biology. Daniele. So you have seen how collecting the genetic information is pretty easy nowadays. Potentially, we'd have our disposition the products of 4.5 billion years of evolution. We just need to find the best way to put them into use. And synthetic biologists all over the world are doing just this. They take inspiration from nature, mixing genes, and creating new combinations. And this, of course, can be useful in many fields. For example, 
we make the bacteria produce spider silk, providing an easy access to this incredible biomaterial. Plastic pollution in the ocean, we can deal with that too. We can make the bacteria aggregate the microplastic so it's way easier to remove. Tons of meat are wasted every year because of the best before date label, but bacteria can tell us the exact moment where the meat starts to rot, and this could help reduce that huge waste. There are a few good things like a cold beer in the summer, but what if the beer could actually be good for your health? Well, we can make the yeast produce any kind of useful molecules during the fermentation, so we will probably have brews of beer with anti-tumoral properties, for example. So this is a project from Cambridge University called Iglolai, and what you see here is bioluminescence, and the light is produced directly by the bacteria. And one day, probably, when this project is optimized and developed, we will have glowing trees that light up our streets at night. So what if I told you that one day we will be able to see if you're ill just by looking at the color of our poo? That, that sounds strange, but the bacteria in our gut will detect the disease from us, for us and produce a color in the pigment. So you just need to go to the bathroom and I'm sure you can grasp the idea, right? <coughs> So there is this famous competition in the field called iGEM that is all about engineering living system to produce any useful function. All the examples that we just saw were from iGEM competitions, and which means that all that cool stuff was made by students in three months of work. Well, it turns also out that we were in the last year iGEM competition. We started this amazing science experience uh, one year ago when the team was formed. And the first thing we needed to do was, of course, to find a problem to solve. You think that is the easy part, huh? Well, trust me, it's not. A lot of problems were already covered in the previous year's competition, so coming up with something original and, by the way, feasible in just three months of work was not that easy. So after some sessions of brainstorming, we thought, why not statues? We live in a country full of beautiful statues and monuments, but sadly, a lot of them are covering that ugly layer called black rust. So the problem was clear, the black rust needed to be destroyed, but how? Black rust differs greatly from place to place. It took us some time to figure out how, but in the end we found a common feature to strike and a couple of genes that were perfect for our purpose. So we spent the rest of the summer in the lab building our system that we called Crust Away. I'm not going through all the details, but in the end, the results of our little journey inside scientific research were this. And as you can see in the right spot, our system was successfully able to remove the black rust. So cool, right? And let's stress this, this was all done by young students in just three months of work. Now, let's take a step back and look again at the bigger picture. We have the DNA sequencing, the DNA synthesis, the open parts, uh, open biology, the parts registry, the internet, and all that we've discussed today. They all come down to one thing, which is accessibility. Today, the problem for the researcher is no more how do I do this, but what do I do? And this really enables the researcher to fully express his creativity. Also, given the relative simplicity and high level of the process, even young and inexperienced biologists can come up with something cool. And we've just seen some of the many examples. So we were talking about accessibility. And on the shoulders of this philosophy, there is a number of sprouting do-it-yourself biology labs all over Europe. These places are independent biotechnology labs driven by small communities of science enthusiasts with very different backgrounds. There are students, researchers, professors, but also journalists, philosophers, and artists. They promote science education and accessibility to the bike technologies, but they also allow the members to develop their own project. Um, we believe that places like this, these kind of independent centers for scientific research and education could provide a great pulse of innovation. And in fact, this is also where we're trying to close that age gap from before. What we're working on right now with the new Museum of Science is trying to open one of these open spaces here in Trento too. You have seen what can be achieved by just few students in three months of work. Just imagine what can be achieved by a whole community in a place like this. 
And also, there are a lot of incomplete iGEM projects that are just waiting for someone to complete and take them to the next level. <coughs> okay, so to conclude, what we can say is that this development of synthetic biology will more and more allow young researchers, but why not also experienced researchers, to close that gap between their creativity and what they can actually do. What we're witnessing right now with synthetic biology is very close to what we've seen 40 years ago with computers. And just look around you, computers have changed the world that we live in and they've revolutionized how we live every day. So what if these that we have discussed today were the first few steps towards a future where biology, as computers did in the past, will change our lives? Well, we hope they are, and thank you.